Hello and welcome to another episode of Hashtag Leadership What's On Your Mind, a podcast to really help you think about your leadership journey and add value by telling amazing stories by amazing guests. So today I'm speaking to Marianne. How are you doing, Marianne? Hello, I'm okay, thank you. How are you doing? Good. So this is a bit bizarre because me and Marianne have known each other since the age of three. Mm -hmm. So we have known each other and I always say Marianne's almost a bit like a sister to me as well. So um, our families have always been very close and we are literally changing perspective and looking at leadership at a completely different angle. And it was only after a couple of great conversations recently that I was like, I can't believe I've missed this. And we <laughs> definitely need to get Marianne on. So Marianne, just as I start, we've got 20 minutes mm -hmm. to get as much information in as possible. So while I press start, um, now just introduce yourself for the people who don't know you and a little bit of your credibility and what you do as well. Okay, so I am a professional violinist, um, slightly redundant due to COVID-19 at the moment, but ordinarily I would be doing tours um, in the studio, doing film sessions, big kind of Hollywood films and then smaller arty films. I work with a lot of pop artists in the studio, um, doing recording strings for their albums and then sometimes gigging with them live things. So. Glastonbury Festival, um, all the little smaller festivals as well. And um, I'm in an orchestra called the Heritage Orchestra. And we play, we usually play at the proms. Um, last one we did last year was an amazing project with trying to branch out to um, different styles of music. And we did it with great dances, which was absolutely incredible. Um, and um, what else do I do? I also write string arrangements um, and work quite closely with some artists uh, from the early days when, they, when they've just been signed to labels, um, kind of working to help build up their confidence, but also um, uh, musically working together. Awesome. And I just want to add something on there as well, because one of the things that people will know a lot of, and, and when I watch X Factor or Strictly Come Dancing, mm -hmm. I'm always looking for your quite distinctive blonde hair and usually at the front of the uh, of the strings <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah so well I'd say in my early 20s I did a lot of tv work um but actually then started to do less through choice as I got a bit older I um moved in more into the studio side so actually with the x factor I did I think seven years of studio recording so we would actually go into a studio in London Angel Studios is just closed thing um, and we would record every Thursday before the live show all of the tracks for all of the contestants so there were I think 12 string players we go in and it was I loved it the pressure was kind of quite intense because they often didn't know the songs until sort of 2 a.m the morning before and we'd have to go in at 10 and record them so the composers would be up through the night writing and we'd be in there and you don't have time really to make mistakes or go over things. You just have to get on and do it. And um, it was good fun. I really, really enjoyed doing that. So we did X, X Factor and Britain's Got Talent as that set group of people for right. quite a few years, which was Excellent. very fun. Yeah. So let me explain why, why we've got to this point, because we were, we were chatting, weren't we, I think a couple of weeks ago now, and, and you reminded me. Um, because you're an avid um, watcher and listener of the podcast, yeah. that the the violin and the lead violin is exactly that. You you lead the orchestra. So mm -hmm. explain what that means. How it actually come? Why is that historically? Why is that? And the processes. Yeah, interesting question. It's the violin. Obviously, is is the traditional leader of a classical orchestra. But that is taken into any format um, of pop music, uh, grime, R&B, any style of music that uses string sections, there'll always be a leader from the violin section if they've got violins. And the reason for it is to, um, if there's a conductor, to interpret what the conductor's saying um, and to pass that on to a group of 70 people sometimes. Um, or if there isn't a conductor to in interact with the people in the recording booth. Often there's a lot of interpretation. You, you work with a lot of people. So I, I went to 
music school and then Royal Academy of Music, kind of we, I've learned a certain style of music and a way to talk about it. But many people, in, certainly in the pop world, have come from a different, different training and background. And I love how they speak. It's kind of far more real. Um, but there is a language barrier. So a lot of the leading job is to interpret what you think might be being said and to then pass that on to your colleagues. Um, the other side of when you're leading um, is to sort of people manage because you have a, uh, maybe a first violin section of 14 people, seconds of 12 and then violas and cellos and most of us have known each other for quite some time, maybe even went to school together um, and people like to talk or some people have opinions that differ so you do have to and that's something it took me, it took me um, some big things happen, happen in my career, I suppose, and life, to have the confidence and ability to actually ignore what I need to ignore and to listen to what I need to listen to, um, to get balance, and also to respect the opinions of friends and colleagues around who, you know, know so much. But you can't listen to everybody because otherwise you don't get on with things. So the leader's job in an orchestra or whatever setting is... People management, um, interacting, and obviously uh, doing the job very well. So yeah. it is quite an intense yeah. job. As a, as a violinist, um, you can be a leader of one one group one day, and then the next day you can end up sitting mid to back of a, of a different section. And so a lot of our job is to be malleable to what, whatever environment you're going into. Uh, like to be able to blend your sound, to blend your your attitude, your personality. Um, you can't be speaking up if you're sat at the back of a section, but you do still have to play really well, but you can't necessarily play um, in the way that you would if you were leading. Uh, so you're kind of constantly adapting. So in that sense, the, um, you're, I've really enjoyed your podcast and all the people you've talked to about their leadership journeys. Um, um, often they're in sport or in business things. Um, and it's funny because people see people see musicians um, and I think they see that, you know, you're, you're doing a glamorous gig or um, a brilliant concert and they think that's all it is. But actually, from a very young age, I'd say from a, about 14, I've been trained in the mindset of um, putting yourself out there getting things right, working hard, being a leader. I've, I was leading a quartet from the age of 14. So that's, you know, something that kind of you grow up with, um, getting on with people, interacting all the time. And I found it very interesting listening to people that you're chatting to and how much it relates exactly to what I do, but we are completely, um, you know, worlds apart, I suppose. Yeah, and um, I love that so, as well. What, when you were saying then about it, it, it comes down to the, your, well, how you've just explained that a little bit there, it's massive self-awareness that you've built mm. up over that time to, to, hear, to hear things that are not being said and to judge a room, judge a situation, and yeah. you've built up over that time so many skills. And, and so, sorry, part, a bit of a pun here about the fact that I talk all the time about how many strings have you got to your bow? And it's, <laughs> like, uh, and it's a thing, isn't it? Like how many, the more strings you've got to your bow, the more mm -hmm. options you have and the mm -hmm. more awareness you have to implement skills, abilities, to people manage, to assess um, situations. So, um, I'm glad I brought that one off on your podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's very true. And um, I wonder how much of that uh, adaptability is character. Um, I get a real buzz out of some weeks. My diary might be playing uh, with BBC Concert Orchestra doing a Friday night is music night record. And then the next day in a studio doing a film. And then the next day a rehearsal with friends just for free because we love it. And then the next day with a pop artist. Not always, that's the dream, but often there's a big mix um, of what we're doing. I love that buzz. I love having to adapt and the different situations it takes me to. But there are many people that don't like that and then choose to audition to get a job um, in a BBC orchestra or one of the other orchestras around. 
so for me i my i am officially freelance and what that means is yeah you're constantly adapting all the time to different situations yeah awesome so we were talking a little bit before about a couple of different directions we could go with how much we can talk about um and i am very close to my heart is 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 the end of my leadership model is all about understanding success and role modeling success um, because we only see success and you mentioned about all the good stuff you've done and mm-hmm. I've obviously seen your journey as an avid fan oh. um, but I also know probably not as much because I, I know the stuff I don't know as far as I'm, I know all the stuff that you do behind the scenes but mm-hmm. I can imagine there's probably 10 times as much of that that I don't know so hopefully that makes sense yeah. so tell us a little bit about what goes behind yeah so, so um most string players spend and devote their childhood to learning the instrument when other people i i i never went to school discos or anything you know all the extra things that people did socially whilst they were at primary school and early days of high school i would be in practicing so i started when i was five and I learned by a method that I recommend so highly to anybody. It's the Suzuki method. Um, Dr. Suzuki was a Japanese violin teacher, but also a wonderful human being with amazing ethos. And um, his, his main quote that I have had said to me throughout my childhood, and I now say to myself as an adult, is practice and practice until you go crazy. Um, so uh, I learned by his method. I worked very hard. I was doing maybe three hours practice a day by the age of nine or 10. And didn't really, nobody would really know that. You guys probably knew that I was practicing, but you didn't necessarily know I'd be up at half five to start at six before school. And as I aged, then I'd do that and then come home and do that in the evening. Um, and then go to music school and the pressure is, is on. You have weekly performance classes where you're performing to your, your mates in your year it's you know, really intense. It's the hardest environment is to perform to people that you know. It's far easier to perform to 20,000 people that you've never met. But um, to have people there and they give constructive criticism, um, it's, it's an incredible thing. So I've, I'm very honored to have had that training and that um, uh, focus throughout my life. But that doesn't change when you become a professional. Um, and actually, I think I, I went to Royal Academy of Music and people there work very hard. They come from around the world. And I actually took a gap year after two years um, for many different reasons. But I think initially I needed just a bit of time and then time out. But I actually ended up working so hard in that year because I realized, no, I really want this even more. And I think then I was 1920, I think. Um, that was when my drive just took off and hasn't ever left that that drive to constantly keep evolving keep working with new people but keep working hard and you um for me anyway i'm sure there are people that do stop practicing but for me i have to keep practicing every day even throughout lockdown when we're not you know we're not performing um have to keep going and i all i'm obsessed with sport as you know and um i got obsessed with sport by reading a book by Djokovic, and he was talking about uh, he kept getting panic and anxiety attacks and that's something that most performers struggle with uh, it's it shouldn't be embarrassing to talk about but people do find it so but the last sort of 10 years um sport has opened up a huge world about talking about performance anxiety um, nerves in the game and i read this book by jocko and it changed me because oh my goodness he gets the same things i get and then i suddenly started comparing all the different things yet yeah, from the age of four or five we've given hours to doing this thing that we love every day and continue to do so. But you don't get to be world number one, like the the big four tennis players and think, right, I'm here now, I'm the best and stop working. You have to actually start, you have to change your game like I do all the time and you have to keep work even harder. Um, And uh, I I could talk about this all day, but I'm, I'm obsessed with it. It's, I'm also so grateful for it because in this time of nothing, nothing to do, um, I don't believe that there's always something to do, always. And you, can, you always can get better and, and try harder. And that's just a fact. I, there was one teacher I had at the academy um, and I went in for a violin lesson and I started by saying, oh, I haven't had that much time this week because 
I've been doing that. And he just shut me down and said, what are you talking about? There's always time. If you haven't got time, get up two hours earlier. There's always time. And that attitude, yeah, has, hasn't left me. <laughs> the yeah. number of times pe people might come to watch a gig and enjoy the gig, but they don't realize that I literally stayed up throughout the night writing out the music for that gig before then going to rehearse in one part of town, traveling an hour to go and do something else, and then an hour back. And then you sit on stage and like, oh, great, well done. Like, yes, <laughs> thank you. It's almost like, and it just reminded me then about one of the military ethoses of, of train hard, fight easy. And, and it's the same in sport. It's the same what you just said then. It's you actually relax. And again, put, a, put aside the you can have anxiety. But mm -hmm. it's almost like if you do it properly behind the scenes, when you actually get in front of everybody, it's like, okay, I've, I've trained for this. And, and when you were saying earlier about your experience of going through education specifically for music, mm -hmm. at the college and then the academy, um, or the, the university, what's the... So I, was, I went to Cheetham School of Music and then Royal Academy of Music. In Royal Academy, that was it, yeah. So I was, as you were saying that, I was, I was thinking, well, this says a lot about resilience. So what's your thoughts on like, your experience in that and, and how that's built your resilience? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, yeah, hu hugely, my resilience, you get pushed and pushed and tested because whilst, whilst we tend to only talk about the great and successful things in life we all musicians have knocks there have been a couple of things i've gone through and haven't got so, some of them have been i didn't look right as a violinist for a, a pop band i didn't have the right look or um you you build up a resilience so i haven't been many things i've been very blessed but like um there have been a couple of outstandingly large things that you're that have happened where um in a job situation that really are very tough and the, the knocks that you can get um because it's not just a job for us it is it's a passion it is i always think it's like a sixth a sixth sense if you give your life to sport or music in the way that we do because um it's part of your body so when something doesn't go well or you lose a gig that you had hoped for or um someone is not nice to you in that setting and um, it's extraordinarily hard and humiliating, but you just have to, you literally have to smile through it and get on with it and, and try harder. That's every time I've been disappointed, my reaction, I would say 90, 99% of the time is to practice harder. If, if, if I see something that's happening and I would have liked to have been there and missed opportunities, then just practice more. And um, so, is, and I, I think some of that does come from like from a young age, having those platforms where your friends are telling you how you could play better, having, putting yourself out there, it's deeply humiliating when, when, you know. That judgment, isn't it? Constantly yeah. being judged. And, and suppose we hear about it more about um, artists that are singers because it's out there in, in the type of shows now and the TV programs. Yeah. But you, you're in that world as well. Um, not necessarily. Yeah, it's a very good point. Like the whole X Factor format is, at the end of singing the song and most of the, those contestants have never sang publicly before and then they're doing it as adults well I've had that training from the age of five and these guys are coming out there singing a song and then being torn to shreds in front of the whole country by four people like granted that um, most of the time half of the panel don't even know what they're talking about anyway so it's a, a really bizarre situation to be put in but yet I've learned that con constructive criticism is okay. To the point that now it annoys me if I play something and in that setting and I'm not, I, I would rather have that guidance and, yeah. um, and be told. Yeah, awesome. Okay, so quick question. Um, we've talked a lot of obviously the link for leadership for you. Can you pinpoint a time, whether it was conscious at the time or you can think back and reflect about where your personal leadership journey started? Hmm. Um, yeah, I think probably around the age of 13, um, just before I went to music school, which you had to audition for. Um, and I realized it was something in my psyche, in my head, that I knew 
when I walked into that audition, I knew I'd get in. I just knew. And mm -hmm. there was there was a switch in me. And that's because I, I suppose that like the fashionable saying that like, I was owning it. I was owning myself. I knew I'd done the work. I at that point was finding I hadn't really been um, met the lovely thing of performance anxiety, which developed later on. I think I'd only had one one experience of it at that point. So I had no self doubt. All I had was the knowledge that I'd worked so hard and I, and I not just worked, I, I live it. I, I listen to music all the time. It's not just about grafting. It's about also immersing yourself in it. So I think mentally that's when that happened. And there've been several other things that I've gone for other auditions and I've walked in, I've known before I've even played the instrument that I've got it. I should say similarly, I, there was definitely one thing I went and I knew, that that day I was off and I wasn't going to get that as well. So there's a huge link between the, <laughs> the brain, uh, the mind and, and actually the training you've done. But I, once, then at, once then at school, um, I mentioned being in a quartet and leading, leading that. Um, and then, they, then yes, yeah, so I actually do think from the age of 14, I had that experience of being put in a leading position. Yeah, fantastic. Awesome. That was the alarm. I was trying to turn it off to let you think, but you did that come to a natural end then. So, Marianne, how quickly does 20 minutes go? Yeah, I know. You, <laughs> I've heard you say that, and I didn't think it would, but it did. <laughs> so, Marianne, it was an absolute pleasure to have you on today. Thank you so much for sharing your perspective, because that's the biggest thing about this. And the more people I speak to, it's great to get people to think differently. And um, thank you so much for coming to share your story. So guys, if you're listening um, on your podcast provider, please make sure you hit a follow. Give us a five-star review if you can. Um, if you've been watching us on YouTube, we got there. There was a couple of little um, pauses in the middle, but we didn't lose any audio. So um, we, we kept on. We kept on going. So thank you so much for watching. Make sure you hit subscribe on our YouTube channel. And um, I look forward to seeing you all next week. Remember, Wednesday, 6 o'clock in the morning, a new episode comes out. And there's lots of future amazing guests coming your way. So Marianne just leaves me one last time to say thank you so much for your time today. Oh, thank you. I look forward to seeing you in person at some point. <laughs> and, um, and have a great rest of your week. Thank you. Thanks. See you soon. Bye. Bye.